this up. Okay, yes. Uh, good afternoon. This is the board workshop, September 23rd, 2014. The time is 2.09 p.m. I'm going to treat this like um, a board briefing and not a workshop, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Graham. Who just put a lifesaver in her mouth. That one oh. smart. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, we're going to start with um, Dr. Desimore, who seems to have a, a, a time with us every meeting. <laughs> Because money matters, and she's got company with her, Jerry Ford and Mike Olaf and uh, Mr. Tubb. So, Dr. Desmore, it's all yours. Yeah. Members of the board, uh, we wanted to come before you today. As you all know, we went through a, a refunding just recently, or refinancing of, of uh, some of our debt. We had um, over seventy-two million dollars in debt that we recently refunded or refinanced in order to save some in order to save some dollars. So I wanted to uh, bring with me today Mr. Ford, our financial advisor, who is going to give you all some details about that refunding. And by all accounts, this is going to be um, a deal that financial advisors all over the country will tell bedtime stories to their children about, <laughs> because it was it was quite. It was quite a deal. Mr. Ford assembled what I called a dream team and just basically really, really went to work with us. And so that's why we invited one of the members of that team, Mr. Mike Olive, here with us today. Of course, very vested in our school district, having been a product of it and worked for it for a long period of time. So we're always happy to see him back. So at this point, I want to turn it over to Mr. Ford so he can um, explain to all of us the intricacies behind the deal, what it meant to the school district, and how it came together. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing us to be pleasant, present. And uh, let me just say that Mike wasn't just a member of that dream team; his firm was the leader of that team. So we, we're very we're very happy to say that. But back in July, you authorized that we move forward with refinancing a portion of your outstanding Series 2005A COPs. Uh, specifically, we financed all the COPs maturing 2016 to 2028. That was over $77 million. In fact, it was $77,510,000. And on August 13th and 14th, we went into the market. Uh, Mike and his folks up in New York were on their underwriting desk early the morning of the 13th while Amy and I were flying up. And um, over the next two days, the transaction was received very well. There were, were, there were a couple of minor uh, exciting moments in there. We had an investor, a call from an investor, a major investor on my cell phone when we got off the plane saying, if you would make this slight change to your legal documents, we would be able to come in and invest and we think other investors would, would accept lower rates. We talked with Wells Fargo about that, and after their heart attacks subsided somewhat, after we got out the defibrillators, uh, they said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea, and we made those changes on the fly that afternoon with three or four lawyers involved. The bottom line is, by the time that they had finished underwriting this transaction the next afternoon, for our $72 million par amount, we had over $553 million in orders. We were able to lower the interest rates on the bonds. And if you may recall, when we came to you in July, we had indicated that your minimum savings levels were 3%, but we thought that you might be able to save around 5%. Well, there hasn't been a lot of Florida School District debt out in the market, and we were a little wrong. You saved over 11%, almost 11.2%, on a present value basis after all of your costs were paid. That's over $8.67 million. Uh, on an annual basis, it's about $790,000 a year between now and 2028. So we'd like to congratulate you on an outstanding financing. I'd like to thank your underwriters, led by Mr. Olive. They included not only Wells Fargo, but Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Raymond James, RBC Capital Markets, and Stiefel Nicholas all performed very, very well. We did something a little interesting. 10% of the monetary compensation that the underwriters received was held in abeyance until after the first day. And we let underwriters know, not Mike's firm because they were leading it, but we let the other four know that the top performer had the opportunity to be escalated above their peers and receive that other 10%. And the competition for that was fierce. And I went to make them Bank of America Merrill Lynch, who performed extremely well for you and worked hand in hand with Wells Fargo. And we'd like to thank all of your underwriters and thank you for the opportunity of allowing us to serve you once again. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, any board members like to make a comment? 
I will say thank you. That's a huge amount of savings compared to what we anticipated. Thank you. As always, we appreciate the fact that um, Ford and Associates represents us and does an outstanding job in giving us advice. And Mr. Olaf, welcome back to the hot seat over here in Lee <laughs> County. We miss you still. Yeah, this is bringing back memories here. <laughs> <laughs> Deja vu. Mm. Mr. Armstrong. I have none at this time. Again, thank you very much for the team effort on behalf of the district. That is awesome. And we okay. really, really appreciate your work on our Thank behalf. You. One final comment, um, just in case anybody asks, unlike a home mortgage refinancing where you extend out for another 30 years, there was no extension of this debt. The final maturity is the same as it always was. So it's no longer than it was the day that you issued it back in 2005. Okay. Thank you very much. Before, before they begin, I just want to say that uh, we are sharing this with you. The academic priorities have been laid out to all of the principals, system principals, teachers, et cetera, et cetera, all staff. And it has given us a framework for the instruction that goes on in our schools. Uh, the, the feedback to having this laid out so clearly and with, with priorities in order as far as what's expected instructionally and academically have served us well thus far. And we thought it was important that the board have the same information that staff has on this particular issue. So, Ms. Coots, Dr. McCullers. Oh, sorry. Do we have this? Okay. Yeah, it's under presentation. So you'll see this graphic quite a bit around the district. Um, what we thought, much like Dr. Graham said, what we thought would be um, good today was to take you through each of these different um, pieces and to be able to explain what those pieces are and then um, talk to you about a concept that we refer to as loose tight, meaning um, the things that are more uh, concrete and things that have a more specific formula um, uh -huh. for our schools and then also what's loose which is more a, of a idea or a concept that we want schools to address but that we don't want to take away their individuality the different um, uh, personalities of our schools and to give them some flexibility in order to address those pieces we liked this graphic because it just talks about and it shows a visual representation of these being the building blocks or the pieces that we continue to work with and we continue to focus on. So loose tight comes from um, DeFore and the work with DeFore and it just talks about those, those pieces of leadership that um, are very scripted and have some good um, structure to them and then um, the loose being where where we have the opportunity for our schools to show their individualization and to show their uniqueness um, having roughly a hundred and some schools we do have some very unique personalities and character to our schools we want to celebrate that uniqueness but we also want to be able to focus and be able to support our schools and having academic priorities um, gives us that opportunity to um, support the schools in, in a very um, systematic way. I'm going to let Jeff jump in, Dr. McCullers jump in, um, when, when he feels uh, he has some things to share. Part of, part of Jeff's role in this is um, really, is he working? is that the piece of the research and the backing up uh, and he'll talk to you a little bit about a white paper that he's creating around the academic priorities. 
So of the academic priorities, we'll take each one of them individually. Student achievement and development, it's a big concept. So the things that are tight uh, are our continuous, um, continuously measuring academic growth, uh, core values. We've talked a lot about core values as it relates to quality, and um, this is where we see quality being a big piece. The NEAF grant, um, our Tropic Isle schools, our Eastleigh County High School, they use uh, quality as a way to uh, measure their growth and to continue to use data to drive instruction. So this is a, a great piece, and we know that we've expanded that to more schools this year. Character edu education, school counseling, those are all some of the things that help to support that uh, student development. One of the areas that you'll see a, uh, uh, some opportunity for loose college and career executive skills. We learned from the foundation the other day, they're calling them foundational skills. I like that play on words for our education foundation. But we have many different places that we see those. This is where schools have some individuality. Some of our schools are avid <coughs> schools. Not all of our schools are avid schools. We. Um, very successful JROTC programs across the district. Uh, these skills are embedded strongly into our JROTC curriculum. Professional learning communities are a large focus. Um, the different components of the professional learning communities, you've heard us talk a lot about the four critical questions, the questions that we ask our schools to go through in their PLC process. What do we want kids to learn? How are we going to get them there? What happens if they already know the information? What happens if they're struggling to learn the information? These are some of the um, just the must-dos for professional learning communities, but how and when they incorporate their PLCs, that really is at the flexibility of the school. Data-driven systems. We heard this come up during our accreditation process that um, this is an area for us to begin to focus and to improve our work. Here are some of the pieces that are the tight pieces that we think are um, critical. MTSS process, multi-tiered system of support. This is a critical component. Using the PLC and those, those uh, four critical questions, there's some overlap here and that becomes important progress monitoring. And then, um, an electronic lesson planning tool. We have a district created product and then we have multiple schools that have used a commercial product called OnCourse for many years. Standards-based instruction. I'm gonna let Jeff talk a little bit about the history of standards here in Florida. When we talk about standards-based instruction, we're talking about teaching, kid, teaching our teachers and working with our teachers to use the standards. We're not talking about which standards or making um, judgment on the standards. Yes, absolutely. The, and you've seen some documents from us and, and some white paper drafts have been circulating about standards-based instruction. Um, that's been the topic of the year, of course. <laughs> And when we, we, as Chrissy said, the standards we're talking about are simply a set of standards. Whatever set of standards is, has, is determined by a jurisdiction, when uh, teachers work towards achieving those standards, you, it results in high achievement. We've, we've known that for some time. Um, there was a, a study that will be in the white paper that we'll provide to you. Um, in uh, an early one in Oklahoma, uh, they studied 10,000 students uh, when they set up some new standards. This is some time ago, but when they set up uh, standards and, and worked towards those standards, they saw immediate responses in uh, improvement in science and math. Um, you usually see early gains in, in topics like that. In topics like reading and writing, there's a little bit of a lag, but you see the same effect. Student engagement, some of the tight pieces of student engagement are the Gallup student engagement poll and then the student engagement strategies. We also um, 
could probably put in here for our NEAF grant schools the keys survey that our uh, teachers and our students participate in. That's not in all of our schools, so it hasn't been included here, but it measures um, student engagement, it me measures teacher engagement, and um, we're very proud of that work and we'll continue that work. Student engagement strategies, there are a lot of different student engagement strategies. And, and um, one of the places that we put much of our uh, professional development focus this past summer were the Kagan strategies. We have almost all of our teachers have at one time taken the Kagan strategies. We offered what I think was a um, good opportunity for our first year teachers, our beginning teachers, was that before they stepped foot in our classrooms this year, they had uh, the first day of the Kagan strategy. So they walked into the classroom with tools in their tool belt on how to uh, engage students in learning. I never was given that op opportunity to have those tools, and I know there was many of us who didn't have that opportunity. I think that we will see, we will see that pay off um, as we go on. They will be offered the second day of the Kagan training because the initial training is two days in October. And we're excited for that for our first year teachers or our new teachers to the district as well as all of our teachers. Student-led conferences, uh, data notebooks, data chats, all of those are opportunities to engage students and to engage families as well as the student into their learning process. Okay, so uh, what we have uh, been working on for a while is to um, assemble the research base behind some of these uh, priorities, actually behind all of them. Uh, we're almost there. We have a few sections to fill in. We have a draft that's ready for you to review if you'd like to see it. Uh, we'll have it ready shortly in its final form. And the idea is that we'll keep adding to it. Um, as we get more experience ourselves with some of these, um, you know, we'll, we may look for additional guidance on what works, what doesn't work, what works here, what doesn't work there, um, to try to create a body of knowledge that uh, we can all draw from. The, uh, the white paper that we have um, is, is written in academic form and we have the articles available on SharePoint so that we'll be able to share them and discuss them as we work with uh, schools and principals and teachers. Are there any questions? Hmm. That was fast. Board members. <laughs> um, I don't have any questions right now, but thank you very much. Mrs. Dozier? Do you have any questions? Very good. Thank you. Just one question. Um, you said you'll be sharing this with schools and um, teachers. Do you have a calendar when you're going to be doing that? I don't know that we do, but some of it's out there already. At the final form, I don't know. We're, we're working on it as fast as we can. Are you, ask, are you asking about the white paper or the, the priorities paper, right. in general, sir? Uh, both, actually. The priorities um, have, have been <laughs> shared with schools and with teachers. It was a large focus. We built our summer training schedule, our professional development training schedule, to meet the needs. And um, you see a lot of these same strategies and these same pieces within the strategic plan as well as within um, Dr. Graham's goals. So they're recurring themes and recurring um, pieces throughout each of those documents. The white paper, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you, Jeff works very hard on, on the charter schools, and we know it's charter school crunch time right, right. now, and so that's where a lot of his focus has been, but it's coming shortly. Is there any way I can get you to email me the calendar when you guys got something set up? Sure. Please. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, I have a question. How do we, as a district, pilot different commercial offerings that support the, 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 the tight part or the lean part of the process? Um, I mean, it seems to me with a, with a district this size, there would be an opportunity to pilot different programs and then compare, assuming they're in demographically similar schools, compare the impact of those programs. And yet my sense is that at this point we're still making a top-down decision 
in terms of some, and so, the, you know, that's, do you understand my question? Mm -hmm. How do we separate the top down from the bottom up and explore opportunities at the, at the local school level? So student engagement strategies is a great place to illustrate that. Many of the pieces in the loose category, such as Kagan, such as Thinking Maps, actually bubbled up from the schools. Right. And so um, the ideas, or these are the priorities, uh, were created in conjunction with uh, teaching and learning as well as the school development. So kind of set the big pieces. And then what are those pieces within? There's a lot of autonomy for the schools hence the loose part. But in the idea of piloting some of those, I'll use the Leader in Me program. There is um, multiple schools who received a grant through the Leader in Me um, company and with matching dollars from other places. So we're running those um, program evaluations using those schools as pilot schools, just like you said, and looking at data compared to schools that aren't in the pilot or aren't using the program with the idea as to if something um, in that program evaluation comes out and we go, whoa, this had tremendous effect, that's where we would look to, okay, maybe this needs to go from loose to tight because we're having such great um, response to the program and student achievement is, has increased and discipline is down and attendance is up. So really, it's a um, that pilot and that program evaluation could drive some changes um, if we have positive results. Did that answer your question? It, it did, but I'm going to be a little bit more specific. So did Leader and Me come to the district and then schools wanted to pilot it? Or did schools want to pilot it and come to the district and say, we'd like to have a shot at this and how do we go about doing it? School generated. OK, good. That answered the question. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? I just I want to comment on the. Um, the Gallup student engagement poll that was mentioned. Let me just pull it up again. I just had it. Just to tell you what's going to be measured, because the same thing is measured for employees as well, and we'll be bringing, I'll be bringing a recommendation soon to um, the, the, the student poll is free. It does a little good without the teacher poll, because what you find sometimes is teachers think students are very engaged, and then you survey the students and not so much. That we want, and the goal is to have those match. But the things that are uh, measured, they call hope, engagement, and well-being, and it's grades five through twelve, and it's a very it's a very quick survey, but gives a tremendous amount of information because engagement is one of the things that is proven at this point, one of the main things that's proven to uh, increase student achievement. So when they're talking about the student engagement, those are the things that will be measured. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Two of our newest, yet not new at all, administrators just new to their roles is the Fountain and Miss Stevens. Good afternoon, Dr. Graham and board members. Um, first, we would like to thank you for the vote of confidence in us <laughs> as we <laughs> enter our new roles. Um, and uh, we're both very happy with the opportunity, so we do appreciate that. Um, we're here to share with you today some five-year grant requirements from Head Start. Uh, we have previously historically been on a three-year cycle for our grants, and now we have gone to a five-year cycle. The reason um, that we are able to, we were invited to apply for the five-year cycle because we've had no areas of noncompliance and no deficiencies. So that gives us that opportunity. Um, the focus, as in all federal grants, is now uh, the focus is on performance rather than compliance. And so Head Start is moving in that same direction. Um, the, new, there are, the new requirements that we have, the purpose of them from the Head Start office is to improve oversight, to assure quality of services, and to increase communication with the regional office so that we have more communication going back and forth. Uh, you may have known that there have been Head Start programs across the country, not here in Lee County ever, ever, but across the country who have gotten into problems. And so the purpose of this is to try to avoid doing that. 
So there are four things that we have to do. We have been approved for the grant, and so the things that we need to do now are communicate with the regional office about school readiness. There is an audit training webcast that has to be done within uh, the first year. There's a health and safety screener, and the board will need to sign a certificate about that. And then there's a governance screener, and the board will need to sign a certificate saying that we've completed that. So we're going to share just a little bit of information about each of those things with you. The school readiness approach is a minimum of two calls per year with a board and Head Start staff. Um, we're anticipating that it would only be one board member. And uh, as you know, uh, Ms. Morgan has been our liaison, and so hopefully we can make those arrangements. Um, but some of you may be called upon at, from time to time. Uh, and that is really just to look at our progress. We have set goals for our students, and we will be talking about the progress of those goals during those phone calls, and are we making progress? Are there any needs uh, for the program? So that's what that's about. And the next thing is an audit webinar, and this has to be re uh, viewed within the first six months of the five-year project. It's intended for board members, fiscal staff, and Head Start staff to review it. We know that this will be a riveting topic for you, so we made sure that we um, included the uh, web address there. It's about a three-hour webinar, so um, whenever you want to tune in, you're, you're certainly able to do that, and when you do, you you would register for a certificate so that we would get credit that our district has participated. So we'll be doing that. There's also written transcripts that are available for that. Another thing that we had to do was a health and safety screener. This has been a big issue in the Head Start community, uh, making sure that, that the students are safe in the program. And so within 45 days of the start of the school year, we had to complete a Head Start screener. We still have some days left, but led by our own school nurse, Karen Snyder, who's sitting here on the front row. Uh, she led the team to, uh, of, it was Head Start staff, it was safety staff, personnel, and transportation. And some of the issues, you have a copy of the screener, but it was things like, is the environment safe? Um, is there emergency lighting in the room? Are the background checks done on all of our employees? Um, is there a procedure to make sure that children are not left alone on a bus? And that came from, you know, that comes from transportation. So it was topics like that. Uh, 19 sites were visited, over 50 classrooms were visited to make sure that um, we are in compliance with all health, health safety, personal, um, personnel and transportation issues throughout our program. So there will be a request in the future for you to sign off on that and that would have to be submitted to the regional office within 75 days of the start of our um, school year. So that's coming up. And with that, Maggie's going to talk to you about the governance screener, which involves you directly. Good afternoon, everyone. The governance leadership and oversight screener looks at the capacity of both the grantee and the program to oversee the grant. And so the governance screener needs to be completed within the first 60 days of the start of the project. So this is different than the health screener, which they waited for the kids to start school. Our project year starts August 1st. So we uh, started the project with our policy council, which is very much like the district advisory council. They are members from every school. And they have gone through first the executive board and then the entire policy council went through the screener and they have passed it. And then um, after that, we need to complete the certification where we ask you to sign off that yes, we have completed this screener and the screener was conducted and then also a training plan was developed and I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. And then we submit the certification to the Office of Head Start within 75 days from the start of the project, which is August 1st. So that's by August 14th, I mean by October 14th. One of the things that's important to Head Start is that we communicate to you in a number of ways. Um, we give you monthly and annual reports. Those are required and there's some very specific things that we must tell you. So we tell you about the number of children we serve, the number of children on the waiting list, the number of meals served, and lots of other very specific information that the Office of Head Start feels it's important for you to know. 
We also do board presentations um, such as this one. We always encourage you to come visit our programs. We know a number of you have. Um, we always enjoy that. And then our grants and plans come to you. Our grants come to you each time to be um, through the regular grant process to be approved. And then it's a Head Start requirement that all of our plans, and in Head Start you have a plan for everything, all of those must be um, made available to you. And so they'll be available electronically through the superintendent's office. Otherwise, it's a, it's a very, very large binder. The board responsibilities, many of the responsibilities that the Office of Head Start expects are embedded in, in our organization as a whole. So things like you're responsible for the major, major financial expenditures, the operating budget, financial audits, personnel policies, all of those things are we, are, we just fall under the district as a whole for that. There are some Head Start specific things. For instance, each year we are cry are required to do an annual self-assessment, and then we must send the self-assessment and any action plan to you for approval. When the federal government comes to monitor us, which is it has been every three years, then we need to send you the letter, and if there is any follow-up, which there hasn't been, but if it was necessary, we would have to create an action plan, and the board would have to sign off on that action plan. Training and technical assistance is the part that the Office of Head Start is asking us to create. We feel like we communicate with you in a number of ways, but they would like us to identify a system for training and technical assistance to meet your needs, which may not be the needs that we think of, and then um, that we ensure oversight of that so that you have all the information that you feel comfortable in the oversight of the Head Start program. So in summary, there, um, the health and safety indicators are in place, and it proves that children and they're in their learning environment, it's um, safe and healthy mm -hmm. for children, that the gov um, program governance elements are in place to safeguard the federal funding and provide proper oversight, and then the board is required to make a decision about the kind of training and technical assistance they feel that's needed in de developing a, a TA plan. And so, do you have any questions or comments for us? Mr. Armstrong, do you have any questions? No, ma'am, I do not. Mrs. Dozier? Yes. Um, how many students do you currently have on the waiting list? Right now, because it's the beginning of the year, we have about um, a little over 650. Um, generally, it is, you know, by the end of the year, it's close to 1,000 children. It usually is very close to the number of children we serve. All right. And that was what I thought that we always have a tremendous waiting list every year. Um, what, what would we need to do to try to provide services for all of those students that are on the waiting list? Um, my first thought is it's, it's a, there's a facilities issue because we are, we are capped at the number of children in, in classrooms and we have to meet very specific health and safety. So that's one issue, but we would have to act um, be able to access funding for those children. Many of them could access VPK funding, um, but that is only a three hour a day and that funding does not, does not cover a degree teacher and paraprofessional. And that is what we have in all of our classrooms. So that would help, but additional funding would be required. Okay. All right, thank you. Mrs. Fisher? <clears throat> Um, yes, how, how is the criteria for choosing the kids who do get into the program mm -hmm. established? That's a very good question. It actually becomes a board policy. The, um, the progression is that every year we are required to write a community assessment report based on what does Lee County look like and what are the needs, the greatest needs in the community. And then that informs an eligibility and selection committee. And they look at all of those needs and then develop a point criteria because to be, to be simply to meet federal guidelines isn't enough because that's why we have 650 on the wait list. Um, they meet those guidelines. But then there are additional criteria, for instance, um, incarcerated parents, um, single, parents. single parent family, low income, lo uh, low um, education level of the parents. That's, that's a research proven of um, uh, 
indicator of lack of school, school success. So all of those things, and then once, once that committee makes its recommendation, it goes before the policy council and they must approve it, and then it comes before the board as a board policy. And that comes to you usually in the fall because we will use it again, in, we will use it in January to, to measure uh, and choose children. So then those um, additional criteria, incarcerated parents, single parent, low income, give extra points to applicants? Exactly. Okay. And, and what is the earliest age that kids can be admitted to that Head Start? Children can come into early Head Start as young as, as three weeks old. Early Head Start partners with the LAMP program, and three weeks is the criteria for LAMP program. Um, to come in, and then that's a, that's a birth to a pregnant woman through age three, and then in Head Start, it's for threes and fours. We primarily serve fours because we have such a large list and we want children to get some service. The only threes we serve are children with IEPs who are being mainstreamed in an inclusion setting in our, in our classrooms, and then also those children who are transitioning out of early and into our Head Start program so they don't lose any time by you know, falling out of a program. So then that's the thing, that the number of people applying and the long waiting list is the thing that is prohibiting many three-year-olds from participating in the program. That's true. In, in many places, Head Start is a 3-4 program, yes. and you have them for two years, but because we would like to give everybody some quality, and, and so that means that we, we serve very few threes. That's true. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to say, first of all, you guys are very quiet about your accomplishments. Last year you got national recognition, Ms. LaFountain, for, for your work and for the Head Start program you, you run here. And I have sat in on the strategic planning that's been done as part of Policy Council, and i got to say, these guys know how to run an organization. They do an outstanding job. You have a thousand over a thousand students now, 600 on the waiting list, and the waiting and, and there is no advertising whatsoever of Head Start. All of our students come in by word of mouth, so you can imagine what the numbers would be if we advertised that we provided these these services. Um, I was going to say something else. Oh, I was going to ask you, what what is your administrative cost, and what does Head Start allow? Do you know offhand the uh, percentage? Mm -hmm. Head Start allows 10 Head Start allows 5%. Yeah, and we're, got, we're below that. You're like at? Three points, yeah. Yeah, OK. All right, well, anyway, thank you very much. You guys run a great program. And glad to see you on the five-year plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's, thank you, ladies. Thank That's you. all we have for today. That's that um, great. Any comments from the board attorney? Yes, ma'am, I do have a school law minute, because we have some time today. <laughs> Remember the last time we spoke, we were discussing procurement and specifically competitive solicitation. Today I wanted to talk to you about the um, process of piggybacking. Uh, generally, Florida law requires a local government entity, such as a school district, to implement a competitive solicitation process when purchasing goods or services. And the level of processes required becomes more complex, complex as the expected cost of the purchase increases. State Board Education Rule provides an exception to the competitive uh, selection requirement through what is termed a piggyback. The rule recognizes that there is a cost in going through a competitive selection process to obtain the best pricing. When one government entity has borne this expense, others should be able to benefit from it without incurring the same expense. Uh, therefore, the rule allows school boards to piggyback awards made through a competitive selection process by other government agencies, such as other school boards, other cities, counties, colleges, and state and federal government agencies, if the bidder agrees to permit purchases uh, from those other government entities on the same terms. That's all I have today. Thank you. Dr. Graham? Nothing right now. Thank you. Board members, I want to ask Mr. Mr. Martin a question, but I don't know how it works in this scheme of things. <laughs> I have heard comments to the effect that some schools buy supplies, that they're required to buy them using whatever the contractor is that we have through these RFPs, and in fact they could do so more cheaply just by going to Home Depot or Lowe's. What, what is it, you know, 
what are the policies or limits on what schools can do? How are they bound to this process? Well, I can't explain all the procurement processes, of course, but to the extent that the <clears throat> school district has put out an invitation to bid for a particular product or a service and has awarded that service to a vendor, uh, that they, then the, the schools, the district, must use that vendor for those purposes, uh, for that service or for that product, to the extent that it's been awarded for a particular time period. So um, I was actually going to ask that same question. So then in when there is an opportunity for um, a less expensive cost, and I had just asked this to Dr. Graham not long ago, um, say that somebody is buying some new office chairs and they can get them much cheaper at Home Depot. What is it that requires us to go only with the vendor who has provided the RFP. Well, what requires it is the school board action, right. where that business was awarded to that vendor, at least to the extent of the, the terms of the award. So then they have that exclusively, any vendors that we have awarded uh, the contract uh, to. Assuming that that's the terms of the award. M many times the award, if you recall, is made to multiple vendors. Right, right. Uh -huh. So then where is the prohibition to using other vendors when you can get something for a third or a half as well, if, much. if the award is to multiple vendors, then then more than one vendor can be used. But if but to the extent that the board has made an award to one or multiple vendors, <coughs> those are the vendors that are required to be used for those that product or service, right. at least to the extent of the award. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'll be asking you more questions yes, after I fashion them. Any questions? No. Okay. Well, that's it then. That concludes our business uh, for this uh, briefing workshop, whatever. Thanks very much.